global pandemic we live through today. On the one hand, our aim today is to point out a range of paradigmatic stages and events in the history of racial capitalism uh, that throw in sharp relief the long durée of racial capitalism and imperialist violence, especially when in the so-called crisis mode. On the other hand, we want to explore how the present pandemic in particular has continued to contribute to the virality and disposability of life, being embedded as it is in racial capitalism through its integral features of capitalist development, white supremacy, exploitation of labor, and commodification of sexual and gender nonconformity. So we are indebted to the generations of transnational black radical critique from W.E.B. Du Bois to Louis Thompson Patterson, from C.L.R. James to Richard Nathaniel Wright, from Hazel Carby to Paul Gilroy and many, many others, as well as to the foremost articulations of racial capitalism in the works of Cedric Robinson, Sylvia Winter and Walter Rodney. But we wonder today and want to debate why it is that racial capitalism's theoretical contours seem to get muddied the more and more it gets taken up in the mainstream. Relatedly, and in a wider context, with respect to Patricia Clough and Jasper Poir's 2012 observations, which some might even call prophetic in nature on viral capitalism, Anne Stoller's work on imperial durabilities, and as recently indicated in Vidya Kumar's talk at a SOAS event, we ask what exactly might be viral and durable about racial capitalism, especially when it comes to its continuous concern with productive sexual and gender ordering. A uh, huge thank you to the SOAS Festival of Ideas and in particular to our colleagues uh, Amna Akin and Stephanie Guillon for inviting us to hold this panel and for working tirelessly towards uh, making such an amazing and important series of virtual events possible. So my name is Vanya Hamzic. I'm a senior lecturer in legal history and legal anthropology here at SOAS. And I will be your host this morning, afternoon, evening, depending on where you are in the world right now. We have an amazing panel spanning at least three continents and time zones and an array of the critical theoretical ethnographic and activist engagements with racial capitalism, crisis and temporality. Every panelist will be given up to 10 minutes for an initial intervention. The panel will be divided into two blocks. So in the present hour, we will first hear from Badura Lagra, uh, Samia Khatun and me, and then I'll leave some 15 minutes for a discussion at the end of which we will have a bit of a break, some maybe 10 minutes or five minute break. In block two, we will hear from Navdir Pudewal, Nasib Omar and Altea Maria Rivas, and then devote the rest of our time to any specific or general discussion. You will not be able to ask questions live, but by all means, please make use of the Q&A box rather than the chat box to send in your queries and comments. And time permitting, I will try as best I can to integrate a portion of your Q&A contributions into the two discussion blocks. So let me now quickly introduce the block one panelists. We will first hear from uh, Dr. Bedur Alagra, who joins us from across the pond where she is an assistant professor of political and social thought in the Department of African and Africa Diaspora Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. The book manuscript she currently works on is titled The Interminable Catastrophe, a Fatal Liberalism's Plantation Logics and Black Political Life in the Wake of Disaster. Badur is interested in black political thought, especially Caribbean political thought, African anti-colonial thought and black Marxisms. And she's the co-editor of a volume on black political thought forthcoming from Puto Press and is currently working with Tony Boats on an edited volume on Sylvia Winter's unpublished essays. We will then hear from Dr. Samia Khatun, who became a feminist historian because she once lost her way to a mathematics lecture at the University of Sydney. Since then, Samia has chased truths about the past in Sydney, Antigua, Kolkata, Istanbul, Berlin, New York, Dunedin, Melbourne, London, and Dhaka. And her book, uh, I can tell you, Australian Nama, The South Asian Odyssey in Australia, is one of my favorite reads of all times. Uh, she researches the life worlds of people colonized by the British Empire, and her documentaries have screened on ABC and SBS TV in Australia. And Samia is the new chair of the Center for Gender Studies at SOAS. And finally, my own work has uh, principally sought to shed new light on how gender non-conforming individuals and communities 
have braved the turbulent tides of racial capitalism, imperialism, slavery, and other forms of legally sanctioned oppression, and how in turn they have developed and abided by multiple formations of insurrectionary knowledge. Uh, in 2010, I co-authored a book with Dr. Ziba Mirhosseini titled Control and Sexuality, The Revival of Zinal Laws in Muslim Context. And back in 2016, I published the first edition of my monograph, Sexual and Gender Diversity in the Muslim World, History, Law, and Vernacular Knowledge. And for the five past five or so years, uh, I've been researching towards a book manuscript titled Interruption, Rethinking Circumatlantic Gender Variants of the Enslaved in 18th century West Africa and colonial Louisiana. So good morning, good early morning, Bador, and welcome, and the virtual floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Vanya, and thank you to um, SOAS for inviting me from across the pond. So I am going to get right into it. Um, I find myself with a rather daunting and difficult task of first defining racial capitalism. And I'll offer some scattered thoughts on this question of the endurance and gendering of racial capitalism, emphasis on the scattered part. Um, so I'll start first by quoting Cedric Robinson directly, who in his tome, Black Marxism, offers the following meditation on the meaning and nature of this thing that is so contested as a term today, racial capitalism. He writes, quote, the development, organization, and expansion of capitalist society pursued essentially racial directions. So too did social ideology. As a material force then, it could be expected that racialism would inevitably permeate the social structures emergent from capitalism. I've used the term racial capitalism to refer to this development and to the subsequent structure as a historical agency, end quote. Fundamental to Robinson's intervention is his suggestion that feudalism was not overturned or destroyed by the histor historical and material rupture presented by capitalism, but rather it was merely extended along new categories of difference, growing in, quote, fits and starts, to quote from Robin Kelly. There's also a tradition of theorizing racial capitalism that comes out of South Africa, which precedes Robinson's definition, as Peter Hudson remarks in his piece, Racial Capitalism and the Dark Proletariat, which deals largely with Neville Alexander's One Azania, published in 1979, four years before Robinson published Black Marxism. Hudson, Hudson writes the following that, quote, while the South Africans particularize, Robinson universalizes. For Alexander, Racial capitalism allows for the apprehension of the unique, indeed, the exceptional character of South Africa. It shows how the political economy of white supremacy in South Africa differed from that of the rest of the continent and, for that matter, of the United States. For Robinson, though, racial capitalism is a global phenomenon. It is not limited to a particular nation state, and it emerges at the beginning of European expansion. There are also methodological differences between Robinson's use of racial capitalism and its appearance in the South African context, end quote. Now, there's also a thread or a line of theorization that joins these two together, um, offered by South African scholar Dennis Davis, who writes that, quote, Robinson's canvas was broader than that of Alexander in that he examined the concept of racial capitalism from the vantage point of the global, but that having been said, his theoretical lens was similar, end quote. Indeed, Neville Alexander, in his post-1994 writing, right, after Robinson published Black Marxism, wrote that, quote, the continuation and intensification into the post-apartheid capitalist system of the levels of inequality and exploitation that characterized the apartheid capitalist system in the context of an increasingly barbaric neoliberal global apartheid inevitably pit workers against one another in a dog-eat-dog -dog competition over allegedly scarce resources, end quote. So in this way, Alexander's thesis of racial capitalism begins in South Africa and ends in South Africa, and begins by theorizing the political economic workings of racial capitalism, but later adopts an additional feature, that of the intensification of pre-apartheid exploitation into the post-apartheid era, which echoes Robinson's thesis, which fundamentally, right, is not necessarily how race and class collide, but accounts for the durability of the system, the way that the system manages to extend itself and recreate itself over time. And so for my purpose today, I'll go with the more generalizable world systems approach offered by Robinson and then later co-signed by Neville Alexander himself um, in order to better address the endurance and movable features of racial capitalism on a global scale as such. Now, the question remains is, what exactly is enduring about racial capitalism? For this, I have a really short answer, 
right? What endures is the very mechanism which racial, in which racial capitalism emerged and congealed, its ability to wield old forms of dominance in seemingly new ways, its ability to both account for continuities with the past and the way these continuities are embedded in different ways in the present. Um, this is what endures about racial capitalism, that the feudal order remains with us insofar as slavery as a time that is not yet past remains with us as well. What remains durable is both the crushing weight of the exploitation of slavery growing out of this feudal context and being extended again and again over time, as well as what Robinson again identified as this intensification uh, along old and new axes of difference. What endures is the bind, but non-described as the indistinguishability between the base and the superstructure in the colonial situation that quote, you are white because you are rich, you are rich because you are white, end quote. Yet the call to gender the idea of racial capitalism produces an additional predicament, one wherein we do the important and necessary work of stretching concepts to borrow Fanon's verbiage, right? Stretching concepts and categories but we also make the mistake of burdening one concept with the task of accounting for everything. The question remains as to how we go about gendering a concept which describes the manner in which old modes of domination are made durable, right? This is what racial capitalism is. Would this mean simply excavating black women thinkers that have argued similar things, which is always already a failed project because the more we excavate, the more we realize that we don't know, right? Does it mean gender intensifies historically in a way that is separate from race? This is what gives me some difficulty. Part of the reason why racial capitalism is so contested today is not because people have failed to adequately study its genealogies, but rather that we now expect racial capitalism as an idea and as a concept to be excessively capacious, to explain all things at all times related to any and all intersections between race and class. Now, racial capitalism is used to describe any and every collision between race and class or for every conversation concerning the inseparability of race and class. This is not only not what racial capitalism means, but it's an impossible task and risks emptying the concept of its genealogical characteristics in a similar way that has happened to decolonization and even more recently, the mainstreaming and defanging of abolition as a concept. We know that Robinson's text does not spotlight any black women thinkers. So to say it's a blind spot would be an understatement. However, what if we, instead of wielding racial capitalism to explain forms of gendered exploitation, what if we stepped outside the frame and in so doing actually clarify racial capitalism further by placing these ideas in relation? So rather than gender racial capitalism, I'd like to instead offer some concepts that have been developed by black women thinkers themselves in tandem with and in collision with the idea of racial capitalism, keeping in mind um, the philosophic methodology of racial capitalism, which I think is the most durable element and how older utterances of the master scripts are not broken with but re-territorialized fundamentally. We can see this particularly, for example, in Joy James' description of the captive maternal now I'm taking this from a talk that she gave at Brown University, a talk that I attended where she offered a definition of the captive maternal. And she writes, quote, captive maternals are self-identified female, male, trans or ungendered persons, feminized and socialized into caretaking within the legacy of racism and US democracy. Captive maternals are designated for consumption in the tradition of chattel slavery. They stabilize with their labor, the very social and state structures which prey upon them. The captive maternal labors to nurture the private realm of family and community that seeks shelter from social and state aggression and stabilize the public realm of policing presidential powers and policies that prey upon said family and community. An anti-Black international womb steals or appropriates the generative powers of captive maternals in order to stabilize the state and social order. Today, white nationalists, patriarchs, uber capitalists continue the legacy of defining presidential powers as the overseers of captive maternals. The intended offspring of a union between US democracy and white supremacy was a servile captive maternal, end quote. So as we can see, the idea of the captive maternal can work in a contrapuntal manner, colliding with and moving away from racial capitalism in its manner of accounting for the historical intensification of modes of domination rather than rupture, but also via offering us a different space other than racial capitalism to theorize the predicament of the enslaved African woman termed captive maternal as it were. 
This language of Joy James womb theory is also present in an article Sadia Hartman published in the same year, 2016, The Belly of the World, in which she takes up W.E.B. Du Bois' understanding of labor and the general strike against plantocracy in Black Reconstruction, which is one of the key texts Robinson engages in his text, Black Marxism. She does not discard of his conception of the general strike, defined as enslaved persons leaving the plantation to join the Union Army, but rather she complicates it. Sadia Harman writes concerning the absence of enslaved women and domestic reproductive and productive labor from his schema of the general strike, the following, quote, in black reconstruction, women's sexual and reproductive labor is critical in accounting for the violence and degradation of slavery. Yet this labor falls outside the, of the heroic account of the black worker and the general strike, end quote. She proceeds by asking, quote, where does the impossible domestic fit into the general strike? What is the text of her insurgency and the genre of her refusal? What visions of the future would encourage her to run or propel her flight? Strategies of endurance and subsistence do not yield easily to the grand narrative of revolution, nor has a space been cleared for the sex worker, welfare mother, and domestic labor in the annals of the Black radical tradition. She then goes on to name racial capitalism explicitly in her follow-up to this provocation concerning the impossible domestic. The forms of care, intimacy, she writes, the forms of care, intimacy, and sustenance exploited by racial capitalism must, most importantly, are not reducible to or exhausted by it, end quote, right? I bring up this example from Hartman to suggest that changing the question away from how do we gender racial capitalism to another question, like where does the impossible domestic fit into the general strike and extrapolate from there, where does the absented presence of black women fit into the broader narratives of black insurgency and radical struggles on their own terms. We arrive at a different narration of events, so to speak. And the question of the impossible domestic is also something that we can use and think through via the work of Claudia Jones, who we know extends right this kind of Marxian concept of exploitation um, and gives us the concept of super exploitation, which encompasses the gendered class racialized exploitation that black women face, particularly as it pertained to domestic work. So old categories made new again. And we can see how racial capitalism is made stronger as an analytic framework, not by wielding it outside of its genealogical contents, but rather by placing it inside of a broader constellation of concepts that might help illuminate the predicament facing us more clearly. We can take the methodological intervention of racial capitalism, of focusing on intensifications of the past along new and old modes of difference, and read it alongside the works of Black women thinkers. Indeed, by stepping outside the frame of racial capitalism in this endeavor, we return to it with a new set of questions and new possibilities as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Badur, so much. This was such a fascinating opening. It gave us so much food for thought. Uh, Samia, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Vanya. Um, what an incredible um, set of thoughts to start off with. So what I want to talk about today quite briefly is actually a temporal story that is absolutely inextricable from racial capitalism and um, its durability. Um, I wanted to start by discussing um, a report and end by discussing another report. The report I want to start with is this disparities in the risk and outcome of COVID-19, which was a report that came out um, in summer by Public Health England when, um, of course, COVID hit. Now, this is, of course, about the racial disparities of how COVID is hitting communities. And um, the analysis, I'll just reading, analysis of survival um, shows that people of Bangladeshi ethnicity had around four times the risk of death. People of Black Caribbean and other Black ethnicities had between 10 and 50% higher risk of death when compared to white British. So in the fine grained details of the incredible racial disparities of deaths, uh, Bangladeshi and Black British, in particular Black Caribbean, um, um, the people were hardest hit by um, these um, by COVID by at least by until August. Anyway, the the report keeps getting updated, and it keep the statistics kind of keep changing. Now, because I'm quite a recent arrival to Britain, of course, trying to find my feet in the racial landscape of how 
it all fits together here. And what was particularly obvious from this COVID moment for all of us was, of course, the, it, these stark differentials in race have suddenly been um, made visible more so than ever before. And it was, of course, against the backdrop of this kind of uh, racialized death that uh, the murder of George Floyd in the US, in the UK, also sparked a massive protest um, with the Black Lives Matter movement. Now, as many of you would uh, be very well aware, the, the throwing of the Edward Colston statue into um, the river at Brixton was a key moment um, in this um, sort of uh, Black Matters, uh, Black Lives Matter movement. I'm just gonna share my screen so that you, I can use some images. Um, now it's, uh, an incredibly key moment in which many, many, many communities uh, came out onto the streets in support of Black Lives Matter, even communities that weren't necessarily identifying as Black. So lots of Asian communities came out as well and lots of um, various other people of political um, you know, solidarity came out. I understood this moment as being a challenge to three different things. Firstly, the system of racial capitalism that's underpinned and the template was laid for by slavery. And secondly, a challenge to um, the historical narrative that buttresses a kind of historical consciousness that has as its pinnacle white civilization and the white subject. So this notion that history is a thing that is moving towards a refinement where white civilization is at the absolute pinnacle. Because I'm trained as a historian, the Colston statue and it's you know, being thrown into the river for me would, could not be separated from a challenge to historical consciousness and a challenge to the kinds of histories we tell. And of course, the throwing of this statue into the river also recalls the earlier, um, you know, um, toppling of statues in the decolonizing um, knowledge or decolonizing the curriculum movements. Now, what I want to draw your attention to is if we interpret this moment as a challenge to the idea that the white subject is at the pinnacle of um, civilization, the white male subject is at the pinnacle of civilization as a hegemonic idea, I want to draw your attention to a story that actually underpins that crowning of the white subject as pinnacle. Um, if I, just my next slide. This is a story that many of you would have come across in a variety of different uh, forum. Um, theorists have been grappling with this racist story for, uh, you know, centuries since it was invented, really. And it's the relationship between racial hierarchy and the philosophy of progress. The story, of course, goes that um, peoples of African and Indigenous descent or peoples of Africa and Indigenous spaces are the first peoples and then comes the South Asians and the Middle Easterns and then comes white civilization. This hierarchy of race is in fact a temporal story if you look at it carefully in that you would have all encountered the idea in various spaces that African peoples are backwards or South Asian peoples are backwards from white civilization and African peoples and Asian peoples are themselves arranged in a temporal relationship to each other. Now this system of thought is actually currently underpins modernity in the most profound way. One of the things we've been asked to think about in this panel is the durability of racial capitalism. Here is a story that emerged in tandem with systems of racial capitalism and buttressing systems of cap racial capitalism. Racial capitalism almost can't exist without this narrative. Now, why on earth is this story so durable? It's you know, it, it's expressed in many, many, many different forms by many different theorists and the very concept of progress and its intimacy with this story of racialization is what is of, um, I think, um, you know, central um, concern and problem for us. From a feminist perspective, from a perspective of studying gender as how it relates to this story, the way that 
even when we go to try and articulate gender depression or even when we try to articulate how sexuality fits into this story of white civilization at the top, the way that gender and sexuality become status markers for where uh, civilization is in this schema of progress, the way that it becomes incredibly difficult to actually get away from this story, even from a feminist perspective. This is a narrative basically that the, is um, one that across the political spectrum, across the right left political spectrum, it's very, very, very difficult to get away from. And hence its durability, hence its virality in a sense of it, you know, even the, the most uh, cutting edge, profoundly challenging social justice movements find it difficult to get away from this philosophy of progress. Now, I wanted to just sort of end by having a think about where on earth this story actually comes from. As I've said, it's a tale of race and temporality that is entwined. This is a narrative that is invented in the pages of history books. It, if it's not invented in the pages of history books, it is definitely one of the spaces where it is established as hegemonic is the history book. One of the texts that's cited as one of the earliest uh, um, hegemonic articulations of that narrative is of course Hegel's philosophy of history. And you know, it, what is absolutely fascinating to see if you're a historian of the late 18th century, early 19th century, is you start to see how this narrative actually is implemented in the colonies, in African spaces, in, in the Caribbean, in South Asian spaces, in Asian spaces, in East Asian spaces. This story gets to be taken up by the elites of those, you know, the people called the Global South today. So what is of interest to me is, if it was in history classrooms, if it was in history books that this narrative was established, surely in history classrooms, in spaces such as history books, we can actually invent new narratives. Which brings me to the final report that I wanted to draw your attention to. It's called The Race, Ethnicity and Equality in UK History. And this is a report that was released in October 2018, so it's been two years now. And in essence, it showed that once you get to the university level, at faculty level in Britain, 93.7% of historians are white. Now, this is a staggering number. It gives you some sense of the kinds of reasons why a narrative such as the one that I've showed you doesn't have greater challenges to it. However, I hope that I've sort of gestured towards the fact that just adding elite Browns and elite Black scholars or elite thinkers who have internalized this narrative of racial progress and hierarchy, just adding people like that into the history classroom or into the historian's guild does not actually in the end transform that deeper narrative. So with that, I might um, end um, my uh, talk today. I hope I've given you some thoughts at least from my perspective as a historian, as a feminist historian, of what underpins the deeper challenge to the subject, the white male subject as uh, the hegemonic pinnacle of so-called civilization. Thank you. Thank you so much, Samia. Uh, it's incredible how uh, in sync we seem to be because everything that you have just said leads me precisely to a very good moment from which to reflect upon as another historian, as another critical historian, you know, as to the temporality of history and the way in which the narrative of racial progress and other types of so-called progress have intersected to create precisely the type of racial capitalism that we are stuck with for so long. So uh, my intervention today proceeds uh, from an early draft of a book that has now been some five years in the making based on my uh, 
critical historical anthropological research of 18th century West African communities and subjectivities, whose gender nonconformity, sexuality, and spiritual linguistic diversity greatly exceeded the early colonial virulently violent regimes of selfhood. So for the most part of the 18th century, there existed in an astonishingly direct link between the ports across Senegambia and what was first French and then so-called Spanish Louisiana, the directness of which really often puzzles researchers as a rather unique phenomenon in the Atlantic history. Still, the nature of 18th century circumatlantic exchange in general and the trade in enslaved humans and the patterns of imperial archiving in particular command that I pay attention to many other nodal points of the 18th century world, including the anthropods, Sawida in present day Benin, Kambinda in today's Angola, various outposts in the Caribbean and the Cabo Verde, Cape Verde Islands, the colonial archives in France, Britain, Spain, and Portugal, as well as the surviving oral narratives throughout the relevant regions of West Africa, which is why this project is taking so incredibly long and will still take quite a bit of time. So today I want to address the life worlds of those uh, unwilling transatlantic so-called laborers in their homelands of greater Senegambia. That is, you know, the territories of today, Senegal, Gambia, uh, Western Mali and lower Mauritania, as well as very briefly in the so-called new world of colonial Louisiana. And I'm primarily interested in the temporality of this horrific displacements and its violent dispossessive modes that are such an abiding essential feature of racial capitalism. So just about none of now well entrenched uh, categories of personhood, such as those relating to ostensibly ethnic, religious, racial, sexual, or indeed gender difference, automatically applied or uh, were relevant to describe the diversity of 18th century Senegambian communities. Instead, as a foremost preoccupation of the early capitalist economy is centered on uh, trading and enslaved and other predatory wealth extraction activities, these categories serve to construct complex histories of human worth, soon to be fashioned into equally predacious historical and social sciences. So by this time, such hierarchies were already for some two centuries in the making. Uh, Cedric Robinson, C.L.R. James, and Sylvia Winter, amongst others, pointed out to the crucial importance of Pesa do India or Pieta de India for the racial capitalist project of human tangibility. This unit of value, meaning piece of India, uh, was invented and used by enslavers uh, undergirding the Iberian uh, colonial project in West Africa through the Cape Verde uh, Islands and into the Americas throughout the 16th to 18th century. As Winter writes, and I quote, uh, the Pieta was the name given by the Portuguese during the slave trade to the African who functioned as the standard measure. He was a man of 25 years, approximately in good health, calculated to give a certain amount of physical labor. He served as the general equivalent of physical labor value against which all the others could be measured. With, for example, three teenagers equaling one Pieta and other and older men and women uh, thrown into a job lot as refuse, end quote. So used to establish quotas and tariffs, the Pieta enabled an early capitalist mode of domination, slavery and colonialism that ushered in the mode of production based on a highly reductive and forceful concept of persecute uh, of the enslaved. One in which the sheer level of commodification threatened at all times to extinguish any remnant of the human and for that matter, the worker. This was a racial capitalist intervention par excellence, not least because as Winter Rap warns, and I quote, the Pieta framework required a repositioning of the mode of production in relation to the mode of domination. The former becomes a subset of the latter, end quote. And as you can see, uh, this project was from the start explicitly gender binary. So the 18th century offers a unique insight into how such economic, military, legal, and political tendencies gradually transformed into an ostensibly scientific gaze and how many of those studied in accordance with the categories of personhood invented to subjugate and dehumanize them in the first place made but a partial and always epistemically violent entry into the colonial archive and imperial scholarly journals. Gender or rather sex was one such category emerging out of a procreation driven approach to human personhood and familial units. Whilst it was still not time to talk of nuclear family, only male and female subject made sense to European slavers and their missionary academic and administrative counterparts. And so these subjects were soon unilaterally vested 
with these and other categories of colonial difference. Throughout this highly turbulent period in, in Greater Senegambia, there existed a welter of larger and smaller states divided along the political rather than necessarily linguistic and ethnic lines. None of these polities was monoethnic, linguistically and religiously plural, even when a particular language and religion were constitutive of their claim to sovereignty, Senegambia states harbored a generally fluid sense of ethnic belonging. One could, under certain favorable circumstances, cross into another community or maintain the inter-ethnic and even inter-religious lines relatively fuzzy. And yet, there certainly existed communities who identified as Fulbes and Inke Mandinka, Wolof, Serer, Dakna, Trazda, and so on, and who spoke amongst others, Wolof, Serer, Fulfulde, Hassani, Arabic, and a variety of Monday languages. The point is rather that the notion of ethnicity, much like those of culture and race, fails to account for an extraordinary malleability of the concepts of belonging that were in existence in 18th century Greater Senegambia. In a similar manner, whilst the concepts of maleness and femaleness were certainly in, in circulation, they were not mutually exclusive nor rendered opposite to one another. In addition to them and sometimes combining both, there existed numerous other practices of sexing and gendering, some of which specifically pertained to an endogamous specialist group, status group that was typically made of several ranked artisan subgroups. As their collective name in one the languages suggests, Nyamakala, members of artisanal groups were thought to possess extraordinary access to the foundational life force or Nyama, and be uh, the beings with their own special temporality, access to history and bodily and gender varying properties. So the Nyamakala or in Wallop Nyanya or in Fulfulde Nyanybe uh, occupied a deeply ambiguous position in society and were contradictorily described as feared, loathed, desired, necessary and respected all at the same time. And they ordinarily made their living through the specialized services they provided to the rest of the population. Uh, whilst I have no time to provide more detail on the Nyamakala's complex cosmologies and gender identities and the roles those continue to play in resisting the racial capitalist gender binary, whether in Greater Senegambia, aboard the enslavers' ships amidst the horrors of the Middle Passage or in colonial Louisiana, suffice it to say at this point that this was but one of many non-conforming clusters of subjectivities caught in the maelstrom of a complex circumatlantic system of exploitation and human fungibility. On the, other, on the other hand, enforcing the gender binary became part and parcel of the European powers early experimentations in an increasingly globalized uh, racial capitalist land based and oceanic networks of trade in enslaved humans, whether African or indigenous to the Americas. For example, a European entrepot in West Africa would already serve as a space of heightened and forceful gendering and racing of enslaved Africans in accordance with the more and more standardized forms of commercial categorization and value, even before they were sent onto the perilous voyage through the Middle Passage. But on the other hand, such forms of violence could never fully succeed in the unmaking of an astonishingly complex and diverse forms of Western African gender non-binary existence, including wide ranging forms of resistance in transit to or when forcefully embedded into the economies of the so-called new world. What's more, a number of enslaved West Africans forcefully misgendered, though they may have been encountered and formed alliances with indigenous and even some European lower class communities, some of which were in their own ways trying to resist the colonial gender binary and the class and racial divisions fundamental to early forms of racial capitalism. So what I'm interested really in is the stubborn telltale remnants or remnants of such circumatlantic gender nonconformity as evidenced within and beyond the colonial archive. And one of the key questions I seek to explore in this context is what practices of not only gender, but also temporal alienation or distemporalization and slave laborers would have to contend with and just how in turn they would continue to struggle against the systemic violence. So let me conclude by saying that this temporalization seems to me to be a useful concept for analyzing a number of other forms of the abiding, abiding racial capitalist violence we seek to critically interrogate in this panel. Uh, the very endurance of such violence and the racial capitalist project as a whole appears to me to be predicated on its ability to interrupt or ostensibly relegate outside of its dominant presence a variety of forms of insurrection or identitary formations and their intrinsic resistive temporalities. Thank you. So uh, I'll call you all now to uh, please turn on your cameras and
we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes uh, to engage with the three of us. Uh, you are welcome to ask your questions in the Q&A box, but before all that, perhaps just to get the sense of what other colleagues here, uh, the three of us, what do we think of each other's uh, approach to this question? I'll go first, um, yeah. just because the notes are in front of me. So a few things that have come up. Um, I think, you know, what's so fascinating is on the question of virality itself, you know, it becomes abundantly clear how important it is to engage with Sylvia Winter's understanding of, you know, the biocentricity of our conception of the human and the Darwinianly selected ethnoclass white male and the equally diselected. And what becomes more and more abundantly clear is the argument she makes, right, that our physical bodies do not perceive the story that we tell about those physical bodies, right? And so what can that lend us for thinking about this virus, right? That the story we tell about this virus, this material thing, does not actually precede or exceed the story that we tell about it. So the question becomes, what if we told a different story, you know, about what this problem is? Um, and of course, uh, the, the question of storytelling becomes a, equally important because, you know, as Sadia Hartman reminds us, there is no such thing as repair, but the absolute closest thing we have to repair is the transmission of stories, right? So telling the story differently is, is so important. Um, and that's where temporality becomes so important, especially in your work. And I see that as well, even in Cedric Robinson's work, because his statement is that capitalism grew in fits and starts, right? Mm -hmm. So this tells us that capitalism itself is not a, an historical inevitability. It's just not. Right. And that means something completely different now for opposing. It means we can intervene in it if it is not an historical inevitability as such. And thank you so much for bringing up Sylvie Winter's work because I'm also, you know, I'm actually writing a, a chapter in my manuscript about the Piazza as well um, and thinking through racial capitalism. And it's so interesting, right, how we get two genealogical kind of interventions, one beginning on the shores of Africa, one beginning in Europe. Right, one having the piezo repeat and reproduce itself over time, then into the enslaved African, then as native labor, and then of course we have this repetition in Robinson's um, uh, estimation. So the question doesn't become which is which is the theory of racial capitalism, but why is it that from these multiple genealogies, whether you start in Europe or in Africa, what seems to be the defining feature of any event intervention around racial capitalism is precisely the repetition. Right. I want to inhabit that commonality. And I think much of the racial capitalism wars now comes from what does it mean? Who said it first? Which genealogy do we go with? And rather, we could actually say what is in common across these genealogical interventions is the repetition. And we should inhabit that methodological intervention and extend that rather than the actual definition itself. And I think that's something that was really clear in your work, both of you. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Padua. Sami, uh, turn on the mic. <laughs> yeah, I'm also struck by this possibility of um, reaching for the um, commonalities across moments in racial capitalism as well. However, it's uh, I guess the I guess the as a political project to attack or challenge this system of racial capitalism, it's also so incredibly important for us to be able to distinguish precisely which moment of racial capitalism we are talking about or talking from. And I guess, um, you know, I'm, I'm particularly um, mindful of, you can talk about how racial capitalism gets taken up in the South Asian context after the templates of the grammar of race are actually set in the case in the Caribbean case and then also in the enslavement of peoples. How those ideas are then taken over and then sort of implanted in a South Asian context and not just implanted in a South Asian context, but it's in the era of colonization in South Asia that the hegemonic story that I shared becomes something that historians across the imperial framework start to narrate. So they turn, they, they, the universalization of a tale that goes with racial capitalism, some of that work, some of that really key work 
happens in the South Asian context because it's a slightly different moment to the moment of uh, the peak of um, the slave trade and also um, Atlantic slavery itself. So I, I feel that it's very, it's, it's the possibility of finding commonalities in this strange way also requires us to go very, very, very carefully in how we talk about what different moments of racial capitalism have actually generated, how they talk to each other, how we don't collapse them into each other. And, you know, as, as, and that as a means of kind of laying the groundwork for how we could do a politics of solidarity. So those were my thoughts that um, emerged as I listened to both of you. I cannot but but say that I'm in full agreement with both of you, and I'm particularly you know uh, uh, thankful for the methodological direction that this you know conversation has taken because that's exactly where I have struggled for years and years on in, in figuring out precisely how to then account for all of the ways in which we do our research today on racial capitalism, whatever our supposed disciplines and how those disciplines themselves then discipline us back into the forms of racial capitalism that sustained itself for such a long time. So, you know, to me, the, the concept of this temporalization with uh, Dr. Sahakaj Mohamedovich and I have worked with uh, for quite some time, or rather struggled with for quite some time now, suggests that we really need to focus on what happens to time, what happens to time to the people who are then forcefully embedded into this paradigm. And, and then with that time, right, what, what is achieved? And I agree with, with, with the doer in particular, right, that we're talking here about a particular niche set of technologies, technologies that repeat themselves and sustain themselves and that there are, in fact, you know, the ideology of, of racial capitalism, the subjugation that takes place, you know, in, in, in so many various ways so that the person could, as, as, as I tried to say earlier, is nearly extinguished in a number of these forms of being in, in such world. So, uh, uh, you know, implantations and the progressive time frame that replaces other forms of temporality are precisely there so as that you know racial capitalism can sustain itself and then can extract whatever it needs to constantly extract and add uh, to the modes of extraction that are you know per, per, that pertain to that particular moment in time i uh, uh i'm going to ask you now samia uh, to maybe answer this question that came up in the q a uh, from lara speroni who asks if you could give a modern example of racial capitalism and before you do is the very modernity that you know one could equal with racial capitalism itself it is the modernity itself that sustains you know the possibility of racial capitalism but let's go ahead um so here i've understood that question to mean can you give a contemporary example of racial capitalism um, mm. again the use of the modern um, is very important and telling here um, and of course the easiest one for me to uh, reflect on or think about is um, garment workers in Bangladesh and the particular set of com the, the particular configuration of the commodity chain between your British high street fashion brand and your person who is actually doing the production, um, the, the, the way that the movement of these clothes across this commodity chain is always tied up with this idea of movement towards civilization because the entire discourse through which you know the garment factory girl is held up as um a sort of the flag bearer of the nation in bangladesh is mm -hmm. she is an agent of development she is moving both the country and herself towards this other form of subjecthood of empowered subjecthood and that is the narrative that actually allows for this system of racial capitalism to, you know, be be justified and be somehow for the the elites of both the global south and the global north to go, yes, this is okay for these people to be labouring under these conditions. And what was absolutely fascinating and and just you know disgusting and heartbreaking in the wake of covid was when the um when the factories just stopped of course these were people who were absolutely screwed over because their livelihoods were completely um you know um disturbed but then at the same time when the bangladeshi government actually just brought them back in they were, it was like they were in between a rock and a hard place. There was nothing in that scenario. There was almost nothing you could do that was 
that was the right intervention. And it just showed how, how this system of racial capitalism, we're just completely and utterly bound to it. And there was this particular moment that would really stood out for me was when um, the head of the BGMEA, the garment um, exporters and manufacturers um, head who uh, describes herself as a feminist, she, she justified the return of the workers to the factory by saying that, oh, workers, have a particular special strength that actually makes them immune to COVID. And hence, this is why they should return to the factories. And it just, it really highlighted for me how you can't, you actually just can't, you can't add brown elites to the mix and expect the story to be dismantled. It's actually incredibly complicated. So I hope I've answered your question there, Lara, in a rambling uh, way. I'll, I'll ask Bedur to, 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 for any uh, final intervention in this block, and then I think uh, we will await other questions as we progress. Uh, so originally we were thinking uh, of, of having a five minute break and so on, but perhaps it's better if we then immediately soldier on and, 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 and you know, go into the block two. So Bedur, and then we will start with block two. Yeah, just a few thoughts on the question of, you know, modern examples of racial capitalism. And I think Vanya said it so well, right, that racial capitalism, right, is the foundation upon which the inauguration of modernity rested and was made possible, right? And so then the question is, can we find an iteration, you know, that isn't explicitly modern? I don't necessarily think so. And um, thinking about the question of time and temporality, I'm, you know, my favorite writer, you know, is Derek Walcott, and he calls himself, you know, poet of the twilight, right? This kind of idea of the archipelago time, that he is writing from a time that is always not quite, right? So knowing what we do about linear temporality, and also knowing that the most of the world is on a different clock, right, than the one given to us then, what can we then, he says that he's able to tell a different story, right? Being a poet of the twilight, being a poet of this archipelago time. Um, so how do these clocks confront and come up against each other. And just on the question, on, on, you know, it's fascinating that the, the head of the garments um, organization is, you know, a feminist. And it reminds me of um, Sylvia Winter's critique of feminism and beyond liberal and Marxist Leninist feminisms, where she says that I am not against feminism. I'm simply afraid of what it has become, right? And I think this is, and, you know, and a lot of times those words are used and weaponized against other women as if she is, right, critiquing any woman doing anything, right? But she is afraid of what feminism has become because feminism has now made its claim as an ethnoclass marker in the same way that man's overrepresented status has, right? And so we can see that, especially in your critique of the way these brown faces enter these spaces um, and stabilize the conditions rather than, you know, interrupt them. So those are just some, I'll leave it there, yeah. Thank you so much. So. Uh... Uh, it's been so fascinating so far, and we will move on and add some more complexity to the mix. So uh, the three of our other speakers are here with us as well. And here before that is a reminder to please make use of the Q&A box and send in your queries and comments. So in this block of interventions, we will first hear from Natesh Purewa, who is a professor of political sociology and development studies at SOAS. And she's interested in how technologies of political power penetrate and shape the social. Tej has recently published the co-authored book, Beyond Religion in India and Pakistan, Gender and Caste, Borders and Boundaries, and is currently co-editing with Jennifer Onglo, a special issue of Feminist Review on Coloniality. And we will then hear from Nasiba Omar. Nasiba is a PhD candidate at the Center for Gender Studies at SOAS, and her pronouns are she, her. Her thesis titled Queer Subjectivity and Sexual Governance examines queer rights activism in Pakistan. And Nasiba's research engages with scattered and diverse realities of queer individuals in order to highlight the genealogical nature of queer phobia and violence. Research in the domain of queer theory of color, transnational feminism, and post-colonial theory has been a central focus throughout her academic career and remains so presently in Nasiba's doctoral project. And finally, we will hear from Dr. Latia Maria Rivas, who is a lecturer in gender and global development at SOAS. She uses feminist and decolonial theories and innovative methodologies such as photo voice, storing, and oral histories to explore the racialized and gender nature of processes of violence, 
post-conflict reconstruction and social justice. Althea Maria moved to SOAS in 2019 after holding posts at York University in Toronto and University of Bath. So good afternoon, Tej. Welcome, and I very much look forward to your intervention. Thank you, Vanya, for that introduction, and, and thank you, everyone, for other presenters here and people who are attending. Um, I'm going to basically um, be presenting today in a kind of experimental way. I have, I'm going to be actually talking, it's quite autobiographical in many ways, and be talking about the town that I was raised in, and it's not a place I've done actually research on. Uh, so we'll talk, we'll think about it as kind of ethnographic notes that are in the making. Um, and I'm going to begin by, um, let me just show you, I'll show you a few slides so I don't have to keep going back and forth into. Okay. So I'm going to begin. I'm going to be talking about a place called Marion, Ohio, in the Midwest of the United States. Um, as Vanya mentioned, I have ordinarily done work on my research is primarily focused on South Asia, but this is a town that I grew up in. Um, and my house actually is on the end of the street of one of these um, buildings that you can see here. On the left is the tomb of the 29th president of the United States. It was Warren G. Harding. Um, and and he served during 1921 to 1923 and died while he was in office. And on the right, you can see his home where he fought the election of 1920, 100 years ago. So I thought this would be a moment, in many ways, this is why I thought this was a good opportunity to share some of my thoughts, to think about 100 years on now um, in the current US election, even though I'm not going to specifically be talking about that. I'm going to begin by looking at um, some of the news stories that emerged about this place. Marion, Ohio, which is a small town, approximately 40,000, uh, largely agricultural, but also with a number of companies that over time have opened, closed, Whirlpool, Marion Power Shovel. Um, there's a Honda plant about an hour away um, where you can see the kind of changes and you can track the ways in which capitalism has it's worked its way through places like this, which are now being labeled the Rust Belt and simultaneously the Corn Belt, are those kinds of places which are viewed, if you drive down the streets, you see many Trump signs in people's front yards as being the kind of populations which have, have, been, have been part of the kind of populist wave of white supremacy on the one hand, but also you know, in terms of following Trump and being highly uncritical of, of the kind of, um, uh, anti-racist politics that we see emerging. There's also a prison um, in this town, um, which is um, a high secure, one of the high, most high security prisons in the state, uh, the Marion Correctional uh, Institute. And I'm gonna stop my photos here. <laughs> well, so actually I can leave this one here. Um, so well, you, you probably don't, not that I want to necessarily show my face, but I'll do this instead, okay. So I'm going to begin my story in Marion, Ohio, um, and I'm going to then take a step back. Um, many of us here are, are kind of thinking transnationally. I'm actually revisiting a place where um, I looked at the second article here, where at the, co at the moment of COVID beginning to emerge in the United States and being recognized as something and being also denied as something that was finding its way through the population, that the tweet that I showed you said, how did Marion, Ohio get to the top of the list of confirmed COVID-19 cases per thousand people? Um, and so from the end of March until the middle of April, this ta small town actually showed to have, in terms of cumulative confirmed cases, was high, ranked higher than New York City. Now, what's less, I'm not a statistician, but there were a lot of kind of discussions around what the significance of that figure was. But I think what's most important here um, in, in thinking about thinking through the lens of racial capitalism is the ways in which the different kind of telling, the tellings of, of the story of this virus and the virality of the kinds of fictions that reflect the, the kind of ways in which racial capitalism have worked their ways through to such towns as this, um, could we could be seen and it was when the international media came in um, there were two Al Jazeera reports which highlighted how 80 percent of the inmates in the local prison had become infected with COVID-19 early on in the pandemic um, and so while the local media were quick to highlight it but very quickly shut it down and that the local newspaper was owned by that the President Harding that I mentioned before who's been memorialized at the same time as also being 
vilified by the local population, which I will also to, to, to kind of highlight in a moment. Um, and so what we can see here um, is an example of, and I want to highlight what a town like this represents um, by in a, a book by James Lowen called Sundown Towns. Um, it very much fits in within that model of the sundown town. So we've been talking about temporality and time and I didn't plan this, but I think when we think about the kinds of the quotes that circulated so um, uh, popularly around the celebrations of the empire, the British empire, other European empires, around the empire in which the sun never sets in terms of you know, accentuating the fact that you know, the expansion, extraction, accumulation of these European empires would never, would always see daylight. These sundown towns highlight time and daylight in terms of the night and daytime. And what uh, Lowen talks about is looks at the ways in which sundown towns are not um, uh, an aberration or an exception. These towns were, and in, in 1920 during the election, uh, Warren G. Harding stood on the balcony of, of, of his front porch and fought the election from there and did not travel. And he was proposing anti-lynching legislation at that point, but along that came with him were many house um, keepers, um, house uh, uh, help who were black. And this became the talking point of the entire election. And, you know, you can kind of, there's been quite a bit kind of written, written up around the local, in the local press around um, his story in that there were allegations that were made by local, very influential business owners, um, people who were involved in, in, in the legal profession as well, who used the so-called one drop rule that any black blood at all would make someone black. And there were allegations. And in fact, some people have even said that Warren G. Harding was the first black president before um, Obama. Became the, the, the kind of ways in which this town has understood its policing of race within this town. Um, so the sundown town of Marion has become, is a prototype and not an aberration. So while we might view the, sun, the uh, Trump signs on the front lawns as being kind of as, as extremism, um, or populism, or an expression of the alienation of the underclasses who have been left behind. Um, I think what Lowen's book on sundown towns highlights is in fact, they are a prototype of, of, of the norm. They are ubiquitous rather than they being the extreme. Um, and so some of the fictions of racial capitalism in how they sustain the racial racialized and gender dimensions of racial capitalism are continuously evolving. Um, and it's a logic which shifts and changes in order to sustain itself in working through inequalities. Um, and, and so a, a place like Marion, Ohio, which had to justify, and I didn't mention that what, what happened on social media around the, the local newspaper reporting that, it, that the, the town had cumulative cases per thousand higher than New York City was the immediate explanation of the, of the prison I showed you of one of the, the children of, of an inmate, um, which said that these people are not in the community. And I think that kind of highlights one of the, the ways in which um, racial capitalism and the fictions often circulate. Um, and sorry, hold on, I got another slide here I wanted to show if I can, I can find it. Uh, no, okay, sorry. Um, and it, th so the ways in which the fiction circulate, so as Jody Melamed talks about, that the prison, the example that of, of the child protesting out there with a handful of protesters showing up with very, with quite sizable protests um, against um, the lockdown. As Melamed argues, the state finance racial violence nexus names the inseparable confluence of political economic governance with racial violence. And therefore, we might say, ending the quote here, um, is, is that the continual um, policing of, of, of racial mixing, and of course, this is a place that had not only the sundown rulings, where there were signs that have obviously been taken down a long time ago, for, and up, but many were up, uh, up until the 1960s, that should, no black person should be seen in this town um, after, after sunset. 
that what we see is that there's an, an enabling of the state finance racial violence um, through ongoing accumulation through dispossession by calling forth the specter of race as threat. And a small town such as this um, has a, there's a slightly more potent dimension to the ways in which the fictions around the disposability of the communities who are affected, who are obviously in, in terms of the ways in which the, and some of them were high school teachers who were commenting, which was most interesting about the, who, who belongs in the community, who, count, who counts within the population and, and who does not. Um, so what I want to propose here and very briefly is the idea of the racial contract being very significant within such small towns. And I think they can be juxtaposed to the, more, the larger picture of, of you know, nationalism or other, other kinds of units of analysis is the underlying assumption of the racial contract, which we see um, that is a requirement for racial capitalism to work its way through inequalities of white innocence and black guilt. And I think within that, I'd like to posit the complicity of other racialized groups who, per, who have a performative function and who oftentimes take up the role of enabling racial capitalism to do its work. Um, and so I might, I would, I'd outline my positionality as being someone who, you know, clearly wasn't from, um, I wasn't a local person, but I went to a school there, which was called Indian Mound, which was just sort of um, not too far from the memorial built on um, a burial, a native burial ground, which about 10 years ago, the school and a number of other schools were renamed um, after US presidents. And so the fiction of the, of, of the um, sundown town is not only about the disciplining of, of white society in terms of the one drop of blood rule and in terms of um, black communities to understand their place within a place within a place that it has a geog the geographical outline of the town um, has literally has a railroad track um, which serves as a as a spatial marker um, around racialized difference um, but we can also see what the underlying dimension here is how places like this in Ohio have been shaped by the native question and of course been shaped by removal, erasure, and violent dis dispossession that took place as a settler society. Now, what I think is really important for stories like this town um, is the, the importance of retelling of the transmission of the narrative of the histories of these places. So if we look at the historical society for this, this town and others nearby, we see the genealogy goes back to around 1920 and may go to the early settlement of the town. Whereas these stories are missing entirely from, from the, from the um, narrative. And of course, what we know is a very rich history of, of native indigenous resistance to set the settlement of, of this region, uh, which is now seen as, as the Midwest, but, is, but was clearly Wyandotte, um, Shawnee um, tribe land. And interestingly, you know, what we're saying about examples of uh, racial capitalism, this town is also now known as the popcorn capital of the world. And it's named, and the company that heads that is called Wyandotte, named after the um, local, the indigenous community that has been, that, you know, there was genocide. So I think the recognition of, um, and I think this is what racial capitalism does is it simultaneously, it removes, erases, dispossesses, it um, assigns differential value on human life, um, but it also um, asserts a kind of normality um, around coloniality. Um, and I think in places like of, of the so-called new world, which are settler societies, we, sees the, we see, can see the ways in which coloniality is in many ways unrecognizable. Uh, to the kind of popular republic discourse. So the idea of, of the, the, the burial ground on which a school was built um, isn't as though it was ignorant. So the racial contract there um, you know, doesn't speak because the, the, the population who would be able to answer are either under the ground or have they've been genocide or have been cleared. Um, and so we see, you know, of course the Indian removals that took place during the 19th century saw a complete clearance. Um, so the, I think the removal and the erasure are very telling 
about the, the stories of these types of towns, which I think in many ways are, are the story of what is happening um, in terms of the contemporary politics of, of many parts of the world. Um, and I'm, I'm very reluctant to talk about them in terms of being aberrations or exceptions or the rise of the right wing, but we see as the very foundations of racial capitalism in places like this town that I've been speaking about and very anecdotally um, are, are the ways in which erasure is kind of left um, without the kind of recognition of what was there before or what happened um, in the process of the erasure. The removal takes place as though it was justified. And of course there are many narratives then and the stories and the rumors that are go viral um, which allow for the kind of shaming. And that's what this person the pre who became the 29th president of the United States, what happened to him in his career was by trying to legislate against lynching at that point of the 1920s. You know, he lived during the Jim Crow era, was also vilified within the local community. Um, and there are theses written around on this and, and, and actually in the new local newspaper which talk about how significant the rumor was to discredit him in terms of having any um, kind of genealogy, um, in terms of having any black blood. And um, I think the, what that says so much about is that if we want to look at the sundown town as a prototype, um, we might look at it as, a, as a microcosm perhaps, or there may be other ways in which we can say that the sundown town actually is reflecting the kind of white supremacist politics that we see emerging, um, that it's something that's ongoing and it never went away. So I think this is where the work of the um, understanding coloniality and racial capitalism is something that understands that abolition didn't happen. Um, and that abolition, even as an idea is, is continually being resisted. Um, even within the kind of stories um, that, that, that circulate about the, the ways in which um, you know, communities are organized or who's entitled to the space or even the ways in which we recognize um, how inequalities are, are understood. So I'm, I'm gonna leave it there. Um, Thank you so much, Tej. That was fascinating. And it brings us to a whole new set of epistemological and ontological and political and social concerns, which we hope to now, you know, open up to the debate. But before that, uh, where is Nasiba? Nasiba, the floor is yours. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I've really enjoyed hearing everyone's perspective. It's been such an interesting and rich conversation. Um, so I hope to add to the topic of racial capitalism by interlinking purple collar labor to commodification of Khwaja Sarai culture under corporate strategies uh, in Pakistan. Before I get into that, I first have to expound upon what I mean by purple collar labor and also Khwaja Sarai culture. Uh, Khwaja Sarai is a term which is used for gender variant people in South Asia. Um, explaining Khwaja Sarai culture is a bit of a difficult task because it's so diverse, but uh, in the given time, I will attempt to highlight distinguished aspects of it. So the term purple collar labor by David Emanuel, it provides a theoretical framework uh, to understand how employment of trans people as trans subjects creates conditions for new workplace inequalities. It's a critique of neoliberal approaches that incorporate trans specific roles into corporate structures and um, label it diversity. Um, so while they also cash in on minority status, corporate strategies define what trans productivity should mean. They distinguish between proper trans subjects deserving of opportunities and how transgender is folded into corporate culture creates control over how to be trans. Purple collar labor, uh, it, instead of protecting trans rights, create creates precarious work environment and a form of capital ex exploitation, which has especially become discernible during this time. Um, I will interlink purple collar labor with the deliberate modification of Khwaja Sarai culture by transgender support programs under NGOs in Pakistan. Um, the support programs categorize Khwaja Sarai culture as economically disempowered, creating trans specific roles, which blatantly disregard communal structures uh, created by Khwaja Sarai uh, networks. So 
the main distinction that has been highlighted between trans and Khwaja Sera by Khwaja Sera uh, community members uh, that I've interviewed in my own fieldwork is that Khwaja Sera is not just an identity, but an inherited and shared culture. It has been passed on since pre-colonial Mughal dynasty. And uh, under the Criminal Tribes Act of 1871, British colonial rule criminalized Khwaja Sera's triggering a process of ostracization which has continued in post-colonial South Asia as they depart from heteropatriarchal expectations. Khwaja Siraj have faced legal and institutional exclusion. And in order to survive, uh, the network has created their own socioeconomic structure. There's a socialization process to which individuals follow communal policies in order to be integrated into the network. The main source of earning for Khwaja Siraj has been um, begging and sex work, whether out of choice or economic necessity, necessity, it has been fundamental to their survival. And then there are traditional Khwaja Sera dance performances known as Vadhai, which either celebrate the birth of a child or they celebrate weddings. So Khwaja Sera had been previously, the term had been previously looked down upon because of association with performing and sex work. It has now regained ad, uh, currency because of advocacy by community members in order to protest against derogatory terms. While various terms are used within the community, there is growing emphasis on how Khwaja Sera is the official public term. Um, because of international rights-based discourse in Pakistan over the past 10 years, Khwaja Sera culture has sort of become a subcategory within the larger framework of global trans rights. This is partly due to the development sector, um, NGOs, they are tasked with transnationally funded in initiatives to integrate Khwaja Siras into mainstream society. And in these initiatives, sometimes for the sake of being intelligible, uh, the term transgender was used to characterize all gender variant people. Uh, legal protection of Khwaja Siraj is also predominantly under the category of trans rights. After a series of Supreme Court rulings, Khwaja Siraj uh, were institutionalized as a third gender in 2009. And the most recent act was uh, passed in 2018, the Transgender Persons Protection of Rights Act. So when I talk about, uh, uh, when I distinguish trans and Khwaja Sera, I'm, the problem I'm highlighting isn't that uh, with the terms and how they can't be used interchangeably. Um, I've met individuals who have identified as both trans and Khwaja Sera and who don't have a problem with using uh, the terms interchangeably. And there are some Khwaja Seras who do not want to be identified as trans. The problem that I'm however highlight, highlighting over here is how corporations in Pakistan, when they celebrate themselves as diverse for adver advertising trans-specific roles, they require applicants to distance themselves from aspects of Khwaja Sera culture in order to be successful. So as I pointed out, Khwaja Sera culture is very diverse, it's regional, and it's very hard to define, but the distinguished aspects of Khwaja Sera culture is femininity and performance. And in the corporate sector, in Pakistan, which is also very conservative, which value codes trans labor, such aspects are considered uncivilized. Um, the framework of purple collar labor, it highlights how under a neoliberal economy, identities become brandable. Uh, branding of identities dependent on visibility and representation. And it uh, solidifies a distinction between acceptable and unacceptable identity. Khwaja Sera is largely considered an unacceptable, well, culture is largely considered un uh, unacceptable, but the identity is made brandable through positive image building. Uh, by this, I mean national NGOs, they will team up with international organizations. And what has become very popular is that they create skills-based programs, which aim to restore dignity of Khwaja Siras through economic and social restoration. The claim to restore Khwaja Sera dignity is not a critique of oppressive social stu structures, but it's an obsession with how Khwaja Sera bodies occupy public spaces. Khwaja Sera culture is associated with sex work and dancing, it's deemed immoral. Therefore, dignity needs to be restored through respectable integration into society. So these national skill-based programs will provide uh, uh, courses such as cooking, stitch, uh, stitching, and beauty courses for Khwaja Seras. And skills that Khwaja Seras are expected to learn uh, demonstrate how productivity is value-coded according to gender and class expectations.
Uh, positive image building tactics also require Khwaja Siras to publicly reject dancing and performing and claim that these professions only existed exclusively as consequence of former economic disempowerment. On completion of skill-based programs, some Khwaja Siras are referred to different organizations where they are sometimes able to find minimum wage employment. They're really provided uh, security employment contracts. And predominantly when they enter their, this workforce, they're forced to quit because of facing uh, transphobia. So this form of Khwaja Sira positive branding and skill-based value coding is further amplified through the first transgender trope. The first trans, trans, transgender trope is media investment in the success story of a trans or Khwaja Sira individual who breaks into a position which was previously only held by cis employees. Uh, these stories, they receive a lot of media traction. For instance, Mavria Malik uh, is a trans person in Pakistan who gained international attention for being the first trans Pakistani anchor. And recently, Aisha Mughal was hailed as the first trans person to represent Pakistan at a UN delegation. This narrative is popular, I think, because it solidifies Khwaja Sira value on basis of productivity. It takes away attention from oppressive structures of power and puts uh, the pressure on individuals to produce themselves as worthy citizens according to national expectations. So it is the responsibility of Khwaja Siras uh, to integrate according to neoliberal expectations of gender and sexuality. There's limited media interest in how trans and Khwaja Sira individuals are treated post-employment or if their initial success is sustainable. However, it is even more problematic that in order to uphold these narratives, there is a need to write off social and economic protection, which is provided within Khwaja Sira culture. And it has especially become apparent during COVID-19, which, uh, which has impacted uh, ways of earning, but has also I think amplified structural discrimination. The Khwaja Sera community has been largely ignored during this time by the state. There are no alternatives which have been offered. However, it is, it is networks within Khwaja Sera community and culture that have continued to organize to rethink economic sustainability during uh, the pandemic, which has um, the methods that they turn to is protest and visibility to media and then distribution of ration, which is distribution of uh, basic necessities uh, that their community needs. So that's it for me. Um, thank you so much, Nasiba, and thank you for working on Khwaja Sera issues uh, in your absolutely groundbreaking uh, PhD research project, uh, which I'm so delighted to be part of when it comes to the supervisory team. Uh, what you have done, uh, what you have achieved, uh, is so is such a you know trailblazing effort. And in particular, when it comes to the ways in which you know the Khwaja Sera community gets increasingly commodified, uh, including with respect to this current crisis. And I hope that we can you know later on reflect in particular on, on the COVID-19 related issues and, and, and Khwaja Sera communities. But for now, uh, Althea Maria, the floor is yours. Hello? Okay. Thank you, Vanya. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, good. So um, full disclosure, I had some computer problems today. So uh, the talk is a little bit different than I had kind of envisioned it to be, but I think it, it's still on point. So today my talk is going to explore how the racialized and gendered legacies of colonialism take new forms in the international aid architecture through an exploration of um, the everyday experiences of aid workers, right? So a lot of my research is, is built around the storytelling. So today I'm gonna to tell you uh, three different stories. Okay. So within development policy practice and sometimes um, academic circles as well, there's kind of loud silences about the entanglements of um, race, gender, racism and development. Okay. Indeed, in a lot of places, there's kind of a passionate denial of the ways in which racial discrimination, colonial violence were fundamental to the emergence of the development project, but also the ways in which they continue to manifest today in the contemporary development industry. And these silences have really obstructed our understanding of the prominence of racialized discourses in development. And in particular, and what I'm gonna focus on today is the embodied experience of race and racialization and racism for those who operate within the international development architecture, right? So therefore we kind of miss out on understanding the multiple experiences of people of different racial backgrounds and different groups of people who work within the structures of power of aid. Okay. Um, 
we don't get to gain a better understanding of how power moves through this particular architecture and how identity shifts within spaces where development and humanitarian interventions take place. So in the colonial imaginary, the territories kind of encountered during exploratory journeys were prime opportunities for exploitation, for accumulation, for violence and for settlement. The non-European societies in Africa, Asia and the Caribbean that provided the basis for European development and capitalist expansion, both through slavery, um, genocide and colonial extraction were kind of constructed in opposition to Europe, right? And um, the first group of panelists spoke about this. So, Upon encountering the, you know, the natives, Europeans also created categories of people that would justify their actions. Um, Cedric Robinson kind of alluded to this when he said that the tendency of the European civilization to differentiate and categorize people led to or supported racialized categories that fostered and justified exploitation, expropriation, and exploitation. So race and racism are the foundation upon which colonialism and capitalist expansion were built. And the racialized categories that were developed uh, were used to legitimize conquest and capital expo capitalist exploitation and generated forms of social relations based on hierarchy and superiority. Now, the colonial history and legacy upon which development, uh, the international development discourse and practice is built, continues to reproduce those same racialized spaces and to reinforce asymmetrical power relations in new and complex ways through everyday encounters. Um, so indeed, the racialized and gendered hierarchies that are maintained and mediated today through development imaginaries and the everyday theater of aid. So I'm now I'm going to um, try and illustrate how this takes place through the exploration of four stories of women of color who currently work in or have worked in um, development and or and or of the humanitarian aid industry. So the first story is Lisa, well it's two, it's Lisa and Gail. Um, in racialized social spaces. So racialized and sexualized stereotypes often played out in social spaces, um, according to the women that I spoke to. So Lisa, who was from the Caribbean originally, explained, the social activities and events that I attend are highly segregated. So if you belong to a group that has enough numbers, sometimes you can organize side events, but most of the time you end up being in places that are expat dominated. And even local places where you go are often kind of local expat places. Now, these events are usually dominated by white, American, and European men. And if you're working in a, a conflict area, this is even more so the case. As a woman, you have to be careful in these environments, and as a woman of color, even more so. Having a romantic relationship or even a close friendship with a local woman sometimes is taboo. And actually, in some places that I've worked, certain institutions will evacuate you for such a crime. But as an expat woman of color, you are strangely simultaneous sometimes, uh, simultaneously familiar and civilized yet enough, yet somewhat still exotic. So you're the unknown in a cleaner package. Gail said that she was often actually also perceived as a kind of quasi white and therefore she gained access to certain conversations and spaces, some of which she didn't want to have access to where discussions about the local other often took place. Um, Gail, sorry. My battery is my battery is dying. Sorry. So Gail recounted having lunch with a group of aid workers and diplomats while working in Sudan. So I noticed some of the men looking curiously at the waitress. She said, um, "Who was serving us lunch?" After the waitress left, their gaze shifted to me, and then to the floor, and then back to me. After a few minutes, one of them said, "God, I feel so sorry for these people. They have no history." no culture. And then turning to Gail, he said, you know, you're not like them. The women here are so rough and dark. They're really unattractive. But even though you are Black, you're much more refined. Why is that exactly, do you think? Gail said she was shocked not only by the question, but more so by the fact that the others at the table seemed to nod in agreement and just wait for her to answer, an answer which never came. So all of the women that I spoke to um, agreed that this intersection of race and gender made relationships, whether romantic or friendships or even uh, professional uh, relationships and understanding their own positionality difficult in development spaces. Story two, Teresa and the double speak of development. So common sentiment among the women that I spoke to was that it's hard to address issues of race or racism within work environments because their colleagues refused to even consider the possibility that their behavior reflected racist attitudes. So the response was often, how could I, how could it be possible that I'm here working every day with poor black or Asian people and, and still be racist? So this was a common attitude 
however, but even in the face of sometimes overt and physical attacks on staff and local community members. So a disturbing account was given by Teresa about her first month working in Pakistan, where she had witnessed um, a white British logistics officer uh, drag an elderly member of local staff from the car. Teresa said she was shocked by the incident, uh, as she would have been by witnessing any, any type of violence, wherever she was. But what was more disconcerting was that no one said or did anything, right? It was just allowed to happen and was problematic. So the break between the official kind of development discourse and practice um, and what happened revealed, she thought, a, a double speak, which often permeates in development organizations. The incident made her feel unsafe, but also made her wonder where she fit within the racialized social order and global hierarchy that characterized the project that she was part of. So she explained, there's something strange that happens when people um, with people when you work with them overseas during development. I don't know what else to say, but it's strange and ironic because in principle, all of these people belong to organizations that are supposedly aimed at helping people globally or at least respecting their rights. So you would think that the people who work for these places have certain principles, but sometimes it's the opposite. They come to these places and give in to all of their racist and sexist ideas all at once. And for some reason think it's okay in this space as if being here gives them impunity, but actually, to be honest, a lot of the time it does. But there's something about the industry and these organizations, something about these structures that empowers actually this type of behavior. There's a constant doublespeak, which I cannot quite reconcile. And the last story is of Maria. Maria and the global hierarchies of Green Village. So one evening I had dinner with two friends at Green Village. Green Village is a large securitized housing and office complex near the Kabul airport and Makarayan apartments in Afghanistan. The advertising brochure describes Green Village as a safe, secure and protected oasis of cool green in Kabul, containing gardens, relaxing arenas and restaurants. My friends lived in a one bedroom apartment located at the back of the extensive 1800 room compound. The complex housed EU police advisors, UN staff, international advisors, private sector employees, and contractors. Some organizations had taken over whole accommodation blocks and allocated to their staff only. The EU police advisors, for example, lived in a separate area that was fenced off in the compound. To get to Green Village, you had to travel down a long, busy paved street called Jalalabad Road, which leads to another UN compound, and then out of the city to the eastern region of the country. The turn off to Green Village takes you down a wide dirt road, a rock and then a rock road that is peppered with a few local shops and a high st and high stone barriers that alternate positions down the middle of the road that the Toyota Corolla that I was traveling in um, at the time had to weave through. As we got closer to the compound, armed guards began to appear along the road. Upon arrival to the entrance, my car went through a vehicle checkpoint outside the compound and then was asked to drive to the entrance. From the road, nothing inside the compound is visible. The only thing one can see is a large perimeter wall. Since I did not live in the compound, I had to leave my car at the last gate and continue on foot. On the other side of the entrance gate, HESCOs and barriers were encountered, and then I went through another checkpoint. After exiting the checkpoint booth, I entered an enclosed parking lot similar to the size of a small shopping center parking area. After walking across the lot, manned by a guard tower, I arrived at another checkpoint. Upon clearing the third checkpoint booth, I stepped out into the distant edge of the green oasis where my friends met me. It would be another seven minute walk to their accommodations. And that night, while getting dessert, I struck up a conversation with one of the staff members in the cafeteria named Maria. So Maria had been working at Green Village for two months, but before that she was working at one of the logistics camps in Kabul, which provides supplies for the military bases and a few other locations. She'd been recruited by a private company from her home in the Philippines to come to Afghanistan. She said she knew it would be dangerous, but the money was good and the company provided insurance and accommodations and care for her children back home. She also had made friends during her time in Afghanistan. Maria went home and to work and only left the compound to go shopping once a week. She'd also gone carpet shopping once, but didn't feel safe, so came back quickly. There was a lot of work to do and um, every day and organizing transportation outside of the compound walls was difficult, but more so she was scared to leave the compound. She said it's, it, inside it's okay, but every time I go out, it's scary. You never know what will happen with these people. It's crazy. For months, Maria's only interaction, however, with, um, with Afghans was limited to the local staff that worked in the compound and at the supermarket where she shopped. Jalalabad Road itself is heavily traveled on the side of frequent explosions, which could often be heard inside of Green Village. 
But spending her everyday nestled deep inside Green Village, she felt safe, but also increasingly fearful of the world around her and the people outside of that securitized compound. So the interveners, aid workers, and, and contractors that lived in Green Village rarely mixed with compound staff like Maria. So neither of my friends had ever spoken to her or even noticed her, okay? Though they did occasionally speak to the guards. But like Maria, most of the staff were from the Global South. They earned low wages and had less secure contracts and benefits than other international staff or UN staff. And essentially, Maria and her friends were an imported labor force, a third imported labor force. Employing international compound staff meant, was meant as a signal to the residents that Green Village had a higher level of service and was safer than uh, other compounds that might have local Afghan staff. But the contract to Green Village staff, however, were also viewed by the residents as slightly different, slightly lower than other international workers. So the distance of Green Village from the main road, the obstacles along the way, and the dozens of armed security staff were also meant to act as a deterrent to attacks. My friends and Maria felt being inside that compound gave them refuge from not just the, the conflict, but from the locals. Right? Within the compound, however, people also distanced themselves from each other. So Green Village was a microcosm of social ordering, global hierarchies, and racialization. The compound exemplified the complex and multifaceted way in which these hierarchies are manifested in developments in intervention, not only between, in this case, Afghan people and interveners, but also amongst the interveners themselves. So just in conclusion, I think scholars and historians have traced the colonial origins of development thought and dependency, copying the race, racist and gender tendencies and racialized anxieties of these projects into the post-colonial world. But not um, enough has been done to explore the deeply embedded racialized and gendered hierarchies of, and violence of aid and the everyday effects this has for people living with these processes and how they might be resisted. Because ultimately, I think it's not easy to name racism and gendered violence and their intersections and to understand the very complex ways in which they manifest in an extractive aid economy and an industry in which race itself is fundamentally constantly denied. That's it. Thank you so much, Shatria Maria, for bringing us towards then a particular type of presence, I suppose, and the everyday effects and then the economics of the everyday effects of racial capitalism that, that are both historical and present and in their own ways, right, uh, question the temporality of, of this project altogether. Now, uh, if you have any, any three of you, if you have any immediate response to each other presentation, that would be great if you could, you know, make those responses possible now. Uh, and then we'll have only about some 12 to 13 minutes to try to answer some of the questions that have been posted uh, to the Q&A box. So, Tej, Nasiba, Altea, Maria, you can also turn on your cameras now. All of us can, I think, because this is our final discussion space. I have a question or just like a comment. I think Tej, you mentioned in your in your presentation, you talked about the complicity of other races and kind of the, the project of, of racial capitalism in these sundown towns. And I wonder if you could expand a little bit on that because you then talked about kind of you tried to tie in the you know, indigenous and Native American populations and erasure um, and the, the kind of histories of slavery. There's a lot of different complex angles. And I think with my talk, I mean, that's also what I was getting at. Like we need to think about how these things function amongst groups in a much more complicated way. Uh, moving away from this binary and I wonder if, um, so I thought that was an interesting aspect of your talk if you wanted to speak a little bit more about that. Yeah I mean I think one way of answering it is to kind of use you know what Patrick Wolf calls he looks at invasion I mean obviously I'm setting this up to call, talking about a settler society as well it's a small town settler society um, but thinking about it as invasion not as an event but as a structure um, and so I think that maybe what I should have started off with was saying is that this is the structure of this society. And in fact, those monuments, the memorialization of the tomb of a president who was seen as liberal in the 1920s, a year after the clearance of the entire black population. The only two people that were remaining in the town in 1920 were um, the soon to be president, uh, President Barber and, and Maid. Okay. so. So the structure, the event can, tends to be seen as the clearance, the 1919 
event. And of course, you know, that, that gets memorialized in other parts of the US as well, um, in terms of other places where um, the, that, that racialized violence took place. But the complicity that I was mentioning was in some ways kind of saying, yeah, so how do other communities who enter into this space, into this structure, how do we engage with this? How do we, as Sami was mentioned, how do we think about developing kind of solidarities when we are part of this system? Um, so, I mean, it might even come back to what you were talking about as well, thinking about engaging even in development as a structure that has its own genealogy. You know, where do we begin to kind of try and dismantle the structure itself? Or how do we make those interventions when we, you know, if, if, if it's not about, if it's about business as usual and, and, and driving down that street and knowing that that monument is there and it will be there forever. And we might have different understanding, but we're not, not still dismantling it. We're not, we're allowing it to stay there, right? So I don't know, I find, I think the complicity is around not challenging the structures. And there's a lot of that complicity within settler societies. That's the logic of it. It eliminates others, it excludes others, and then it selectively includes others. The model minority, I mean, that's where the fictions are. The model minorities, you know, certain communities are positioned. You know, that's how the hierarchies pet perpetuated. So I don't know if that meant uh, addresses that. If I can jump in precisely on that point. So I think Tej, you uh, left us with a very powerful uh, uh, you know, trope of the prototype. And I wonder what, you know, that tell us about, ter the, the, again, about temporality of racial capitals and to what degree then the prototype. And I can think, you know, in my own work of the out European outposts of San Luis and Ile de Gove, you know, places that will then become uh, the, the hold posts of the, of the so-called, uh, you know, French West Africa. Uh, what kinds of temporalities and what kinds of structure abide in those would be quite an interesting, you know, uh, 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 question to ask. And it, to me, you know, it, it's in a way at least a question to ask Altea uh, when it comes to this green village, when it comes to the, uh, you know, the, the obviously securitized compound that has its own, not only, you know, space, but indeed temporality as well. Uh, Shall we uh, try to engage with some of the general questions? Perhaps before that, uh, Nasiba, I mean, one of the, I think, uh, issues that have not been uh, so much raised in your otherwise excellent uh, talk uh, is, is, is the question of what happens with COVID-19 crisis in, in, in the Mazda Khwaja Sarah communities, because you lived through it with them in Pakistan up till this very moment. So, and it would, I, I suppose, you know, be related to our general questions on, again, the temporalities of, of racial capitalism and the question of crisis, which we haven't really touched upon at all yet. Um, yes, so, uh, yeah, I, that's what I ended on and I didn't, couldn't go into more detail because of also uh, the time limitation, but um, I was doing, uh, as you know, ethnographic research in Pakistan when the pandemic hit and I was in touch with my, my research had to do with interviewing Khwaja Sarahs. So it was it, the impact that it had on that community was really clear at that point because um, they spoke about it. There are many individuals who did speak about how uh, their crisis was completely overlooked and it was very separate from mainstream society because many of them did not have, many Khwaja individuals did not have uh, employment, official employment, and they were relying upon um, dancing and also sex work and also begging. And uh, this, with dancing and sex work and begging, that's considered immoral in a conservative Pakistani society. So they can't be too public about protesting that they're out of work because of this reason. And then there's not a lot of um, alternative that's been offered. So it, it's still, uh, even right now, it was very unclear as to how they're going to move forward, what's going to happen, as is, I mean, everybody, many communities. But it was especially like, um, I think with with their with the 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 lack of clarity with the Khwaja Sarah community was facing, they were also facing lack of clarity of who to turn to besides their own community when it comes to aid and help. So, um, I hope to expand more on that as I'm uh, writing up my own research and as I'm in communication with them. So. Thank you. So out of the box of the many queries, let me ask you this, uh, well, quite complex questions that Scott has tried to pose in, in the chat box, and then that reflects uh, 
you know, the question that uh, Esme has asked in, in the chat box itself, and it's the question of what is so particular about the temporality of racial capitalism? Is it in any way different to other forms of imperial temporality? And if so, how? And then Esme asked, you know, when, uh, when, when we look at China, and she says, particularly with their uh, tech dominance and frontier scientific work, i.e. germinating the first seed on the moon, being six months ahead of the West with 5G technology and so on. Does this change the landscape of racial capitals? It's, these questions are to anyone who wishes to answer now. So what's so special about the temporality of racial capitalism as opposed to other imperial temporalities? Yes, but the... I have a stab at it. So the, the temporality of racial capitalism, if we take what Robin Kelly says as, you know, the fits and starts, right? I think that's one uh, feature of racial capitalism that, again, suggests that even this linear imperial clock that we're given is a fiction, right? it's just a manner of telling the story and that it's not actually appropriate to the way that or the conditions under which people live. So um, first recognizing that racial capitalism is on multiple clocks, right? Because there is the authorized story of capitalism itself as linear. Then there is the fits and burts of how racial capitalism develops. And then there is the manner in which people inside of the belly of the world, so to speak, narrate that position, right? Which is also on a different clock. So. I wonder if we can change the question away from what does racial capitalism have in common with other imperial times, but rather what, me what are the many forms of timekeeping that are required in order to maintain this thrust of racial capitalism? Because I think it takes many clocks to keep the story of racial capitalism going. And so in that way, I think um, the question is uh, useful. But the other thing that actually it came up in Tej's um, um, talk right on because Ohio is also a time place a timescape right that is indicative of the way racial capitalism develops you can't think of Ohio without thinking about Toni Morrison's work right and this idea of Ohio being this not quite space this place that was in another time right from that which was immediately to the left to the right to the south of it being Kentucky right so the the idea is that racial capitalism doesn't have one clock we are told it has one clock but it doesn't actually right it contains many many clocks so when we talk about crisis and we frame the crisis as midnight on the clock then we have to ask okay toward what end right what is this midnight on which clock so to speak right and so it's less about you know competing hegemonic characteristics of time but rather recognizing the way all of those hegemonic notions of times are enfolded into racial capitalism in and against right these other forms of timekeeping that people like their walcott have produced and, and sustained so a non-answer <laughs> really anyone else the articulation of the crisis perhaps would be, you know, quite an important last point to make. Uh, yes, Samia. Um, in terms of yeah, what, the, what the specific, um, almost definitive characteristic of imperial time is, I'm going to treat that question as if you're asking what's the definitive characteristic of modern time. Um, <laughs> because for me, modernity, colonial modernity is inseparable coloniality and modernity are inseparable and that you know um one of the fascinating things for me is the way in which the violence of modern time and the way that it relegates things to the dead past it's almost a prophetic story where on encounter with other temporalities and here you know the one of the clearest examples you can use is islam when the, the secularity of modern time encounters Islamic time, it says it belongs to the dead past, it belongs to death. So it has no future in, um, you know, it, there is no way of continuing to live in that time in the future of uh, modern time. Now, what's absolutely fascinating, and I mean, I keep using the word fascinating, but it's actually just disgusting and gross, is when you look at this mode of thinking, particularly in settler colonial contexts, it becomes very obvious that it is an imagining of a future that is emptied of certain types of ontologies and peoples. 
it's a prophetic time that actually kills, like it sets up the structures to actually kill people who have ontologies and subjectivities tied in with other forms of temporality. So one of the spaces from which I've been thinking about this question of different temporalities is actually Greenwich because I now live in East London and it's a 10 minute bike ride that way to Greenwich and you go under the Thames through the Greenwich foot tunnel and you're at Greenwich. And it's of course the Greenwich Observatory there which is where universal time ground zero is counted from. And if you're looking from Greenwich, you can see the Isle of Dogs, you can see the Thames, and right there is the West India Docks, and right there is the East India Docks. And, you know, anyone with any kind of historical imagination can see that from the very first ships where cotton is arriving, from the very first ships where hand-woven products made from this cotton is arriving to the East India Docks, to the West India Docks, also arriving with those ships are labourers from these various places and with them is arriving different temporalities. So the way in which, you know, almost every single moment and place in time can be thought of as this conjuncture of temporalities, yet our institutions, modern institutions are completely unable to step out from even seeing those temporalities. It's, it's very, um, you know, I'm, I'm I want to sort of follow up what Badur has said about the ways in which these other temporalities are harnessed and, you know, kind of put to the service of racial capitalism. And again, there, if I think through the lens of Islam, I can very much think of Islamic re reformism and various different varieties of Islam, which are harnessed for the purpose of actually fitting into that um, larger racial order. But it's very, to me, it's always seemed that each of these temporalities that I've ever looked at in detail, and I've looked at Aboriginal, um, Australian Aboriginal thought in this line, and also um, South Asian Islam in this thought, each of these temporalities have inside them architectures of ways of encountering difference and I have to say, the one, the, the, the colonial modern mode of um, encountering difference is the only one that relegates others to death. Um, but I, I might be, that might be too broad a statement to make because, you know, that I'm basing that on South Asian Islam and Australian Indigenous thought, um, who, you know, I, I wouldn't want to say that no other temporalities relegate others to death. Mm -hmm. Okay, such an important observation and something that, that we are you know, left with as, as one of the final images of everything that has been really talked about today and it really you know, builds into it uh, as, as a, such a possibility. So Tej, I'll give you a, a one minute exactly if you want to add to this discussion, then we will have to end. We did uh, you know, start a bit late. So Tej, you do have the final word. Oh gosh, that's a lot of big burden to me. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> well, rather than maybe answering that question, I think there, there's a couple of questions that have come up are in, in some ways kind of asking what work racial capitalism can do for us to understand the kind of um, the unfolding, uh, the evolving nature of capitalism and, and, and racialization alongside that. And I think one of the ways in which all of us, I think are engaged, coming at it from very different lenses is that it's important to engage with racial capitalism um, through a number of, I think, adjacent, adjoining, um, accompanying, even conflicting tools that can help us to understand, because temporality, I mean, the ways in which, I think this has been a really exciting discussion. So I, in terms of the decolonial turn for development studies and you know the, colonial, the coloniality modernity complex, you know, is, it kind of throws the ways in which we kind of center the West and you know, European models of colonialism to thinking about one of the questions about China. What do we do with you know, the rise of China? What does, that, what does that do? Does it unsettle the concept? Well, we need to be thinking about how do we, how can we, how can we think critically about racial capitalism without yet again centering Western modernity within it? And I think there are lots of ways in which we can, and we can, you know, that would be kind of, I mean, there are conversations happening across different disciplines in combining you know, those, those lenses. Thank you all. Thank you all really so much. Thank you, Tej. Thank you, everyone, uh, for such a wide ranging discussion. So I hope that some of these conversations can continue beyond this panel, including in a number of other, uh, you know, SOAS Festival of Ideas events. So one that follows immediately after our panel is starting right now. 
is surely related to everything we've been discussing today. And it is the hashtag Black Lives Matter part two, hashtag Britain is not innocent panel, which looks at the history of the Black Lives Matter movement in the United Kingdom and the United States. Everyone, thank you and be well. Thank you so much. Thank you.